Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Dennis Melamed. I'm editor of a new publication called Environment Daily and vice chairman of the board of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome my fellow club members and guests in the audience today, as well as those of you who are listening to this program over one of the more than 400 national public radio stations or watching on one of the 3,600 cable systems affiliated with C-SPAN. Before introducing the guests at our head table, I would like to remind our members of some coming events. On October 29th, Secretary of Agriculture Edward Madigan will join us. October 31st, Oliver North will describe who knew what and when in the Iran-Contra affair, our version of the October surprise in November. On November 4th, Senator Bob Carey, Democratic presidential candidate, and on November 12th, former Chief Justice Warren Burger will join us as well. Audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available through the National Press Club Library. I'd also like to remind our guests here today that if you have any questions for our speakers, uh, please write them on the cards provided at your table and pass them up to me and I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table and ask them to please stand briefly with, when their names are read. I also ask the audience to withhold any applause until I have read all the names. Going from my left, Ms. Lisa Stein, TV Guide Magazine. Artur Blinoff, Izvestia. Bill Sternberg, Washington Bureau Chief, Thompson Newspapers. Doug Hallinan, Washington Bureau Chief, Electronic Media. Sharon Percy Rockefeller, President and Chief Executive Officer of WETA. To my right, immediately, uh, Mick Rood, Chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Skipping uh, one of our speakers, and in fact, somebody else on the head table. Uh, John Price, Knight Ritter Newspapers. Patricia Keegan, editor and publisher of Washington International Magazine. Don West, editor, Broadcasting Magazine. <laughs> Two weeks ago, the Senate Judiciary Committee was discussing on live TV sex with animals and defiled Coke cans. At the same time, Phil Donahue was investigating the cost of loan guarantees to Israel and the premiere of the new current event show, Posner and Donahue. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> In their long careers, Phil Donahue and Vladimir Posner have made lasting impressions on the television public worldwide, but fame has not come without criticism. Some have taken Mr. Donahue to task for selling out to the Nielsen sweepstakes. They say he has forsaken his journalistic heritage by featuring shows on such compelling topics as dwarf tossing and Zsa, Zsa Gabor's speeding ticket and cross-dressing, at which time he wore a red dress. An admitted news junkie, Mr. Donahue, who I'm told will be running late and can't hear any of this, de defends himself against charges he has pandered to a sensation-driven public. He told the Los Angeles Times, we are asked to be a BBC media, and part of our job is to attract an MTV audience. I don't want to be a dead hero. Vladimir Posner did not want to be a dead hero either. Viewed by many to be an apologist for the old Soviet regime, he excused the invasion of Czechoslovakia, supported the internal exile of Andrei Sakharov, and generally sang the praises of Soviet society. The critics say Mr. Posner altered his views only when President Mikhail Gorbachev introduced Glasnost. Whatever the cause, Mr. Posner has definitely got religion. Earlier this year, he quit his top political commentator on Soviet television when the new head of the State Television Committee forbade criticism of Gorbachev. Mr. Posner told the Los Angeles Times, freedom of the press is a lot like that genie who was released from the bottle, and there is no way he's going to be stuffed back in. As journalists, we might be criticized for not living up to our professed ideals in the past, and that is all the more reason why we must try to do so now. In 1985, these two journalists created Space Bridge in an historic telecast called Citizen Summit. The show linked a studio audience in uh, Seattle and Leningrad. The two reportedly did not get on well in their first endeavor, but the alliance eventually led to their newly syndicated venture. The show is being telecast in both the United States and the Soviet Union, Luckily, it won't have to compete with C-SPAN coverage of Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill in the Senate. 
Uh, join me in giving a warm club welcome to Vladimir Posner and sooner or later, Phil Donahue. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's uh, almost not quite real. On the 20th of August, the second day of the coup, after the first interview I had done with Nightline, when I got back home, I got a phone call and picked up the phone, and a voice said, Posner? And I said, yes. And the voice said, your tongue is too, long, is too long, we will rip it out. The same message was given to a friend of mine who was also doing an interview for the BBC, a man who used to be a deputy spokesman for, for Gorbachev. And in those first two days of the coup, the 19th and the 20th, I think most people, <clears throat> at least the ones that I knew, felt that <clears throat> the cause of... Uh, of democracy in the Soviet Union was a lost cause, at least for the short term. Uh, there are people who will tell you that um, they knew that the coup would fail, that uh, it would be only a matter of days. I tend to think that uh, they may have been not telling the truth when they said that. Let's not forget that the people who took power had the army, the KGB, the police, and the party. More than you would need to hold on to power. And so those who found it impossible not to resist in one way or another, those who kept on informing the population on Radio Echo, which is a local radio in Moscow. Those who created a makeshift radio station in what has come to be called the White House of Russia, Russian radio, and broadcast round the clock. Those who went on the air uh, via satellite addressing other countries, and of course, those who surrounded the White House and were ready to give up their lives, I think most of them simply did it because they felt that they could not do otherwise, but they did not do it with the knowledge that they would win. In the long run, the people who won, or let me put it differently, the reason the coup failed was because of those 70,000 people around that building. Because when the military refused to go in, and mainly the military who did refuse to go in, were a group of people who, <laughs> interestingly enough, are called the A-Team. This is not a B-run television serial. This is the real thing. This group was created by, Vlad by uh, Yuri Andropov when he was the chairman of the KGB back in 1974. It was a group created for anti-terrorist activities. It was a group of 30 men, all with university degrees, believe it or not, and all trained to do everything from fly a plane to command a submarine and mainly to kill with or without weapons. The group gradually increased to about 50, and that's what they are today. These are rather incredible specimens, both in the sense of their mental capacities and physical. These were the people who were supposed to go in and take over the White House and neutralize, to use a, a euphemism, neutralize Yeltsin and several other people. Their commander, General Karpuchin, after having gone down to the White House with a few of his aides and looked over, looked it over, said that it would take about 20 minutes to do the job. 
but that we'd have to lose, as he put it, a few people, about 10,000. And the reason why they didn't do it was because the officers on the A-team would not kill those people. Later in interviews, several of them said, this was not political, we are military people, and we do what we are told. But my brother, my lover, my son or my daughter or my wife or my whatever could have been in that crowd and I would not shoot at those people. Ultimately, it was the people standing out there who won the day. They were the ones who stopped the army and then, of course, that turned everything else around. I, I say this in some detail because many have later kind of hinted that this wasn't a coup at all, that this was all inept, stupid people who didn't know how to do things, that they were not somehow, uh, they didn't have the, the necessary qualities to kill. They were not ruthless enough. Simply not true. They were very ruthless. And they gave all the orders. The orders were not obeyed. And in those first two days, um, I did not think that I would ever be addressing the National Press Club. And I did not think that the show that we had, that we had decided we would do with Phil would ever happen. So now to be able to be here and to be able to do that show and to know that it is also at the same time being seen by, uh, by Russians it is being shown in Russia, in Russian, as it is shown here, is, I repeat, almost not quite real. It's a wonderful dream come, through, come true. The show itself um, is an attempt to do, to deal with issues, to address issues that are of importance. Over the years, I've heard two things from colleagues in this country, and to a lesser extent, but even in the Soviet Union. The first thing is that the American audience has the attention span of a three-year-old and only wants to be entertained. And therefore, it is impossible to do anything really uh, serious, especially at prime time, that you have to compete with Geraldo, shall we say. The second, <laughs> uh, I have found this to be something I can't believe, especially considering how American viewers react to, to something like the Civil War on public television, when millions of people watched something that was without even violence. It was more, it was a documentary with stills in it more than anything else. So what we are trying to do here is do a show that deals with serious issues, that respects people's ability to think, that does not address people as if they were nine-year-olds, that presents issues in a way that people can relate to and understand why the issues are of importance to them, but the challenges, what they have been taught to believe, both here and in Russia. The next show we're going to do next Friday will be a full hour uh, with the participation from Tunisia of Yasser Arafat. The show is called The Other Side of Peace, the PLO, and Yasser Arafat. And the issue is very simple. There will not be peace in the Middle East if these people, in some way, are not heard out and not listened to carefully. It's not because any of us like or dislike Yasser Arafat. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that if you do not know what these people are saying, if you do not pay attention to them, you cannot hope to have a lasting peace in what is a powder keg of a region. What we would like to do is bring on that sort of person. 
I would very much like to have Mr. Castro on. I think it's important to listen to what Castro has to say. It is so easy to say, oh, who cares? This is an old hardline commie. We should care because Mr. Castro is still very popular in Cuba, whether we like it or dislike it. And it is also important, I think at least, to bring this to the attention of viewers, both here and in Russia. Incidentally, we're also being featured in Australia. And believe it or not, just hold on to your seats, in Botswana. <laughs> Phil and I cannot walk down a street in Botswana. <laughs> it's true, though. We are. Hopefully, this show will gradually take on a certain international aspect. It will, it will be something watched not only in the USSR or what will become a series of independent countries and the United States. This is not a Soviet American show. We did begin our relationship with a space bridge, with a satellite hookup between the two countries. And we did think about maybe doing this show with me being in Moscow and Phil being in New York. The reason we decided not to do this, there are several reasons, but the main reasons were that we, in that case, would be forced into a position where people would see us as representing our countries. Whether we liked it or not, if I'm, if I'm in Moscow and he's in New York and we're talking to each other, we are representing he, the United States of America, and I, Russia, minimum, or the Soviet Union. And that's something neither of us uh, wanted to do. So clearly, one of us had to move to the other person's territory. And uh, considering Phil's knowledge of Russian and my knowledge of English, <laughs> um, we decided that it would be wiser for me to move here. Uh, and that's the way we will do the show. Although it is quite possible that if the show does well, then we will move around. We will go to, spot, to places where events are occurring and do our show out of that place. But that's something down the road. It's something that we are looking forward to. So that uh, basically is what, what the show is about, what we're doing, what we're looking forward to. We do it live on Fridays at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a syndicated show, and therefore we have uh, we're very, very happy that we have several public television stations taking us, and many of them take us live. So we have phone-ins. We don't have any audience except the guests that we invite and the people who, the phone-ins. Um, other stations then take us live to tape on the following day or on Sundays, and that's the way it is now. Although initially we had wished to go live only, but because of syndication, uh, we had to uh, change that. And now, what's happening? <laughs> um, my plane was held up for a full hour because of air traffic. There were problems that came from Boston. And I was told that, uh, we were informed rather, that because of that, uh, LaGuardia would be having the problems for the entire day. That's the reason why I'm here alone and why Mr. Donahue um, is absent. And, uh, I was hoping that by this time he'd be in. Well, obviously he isn't. <laughs> and uh, I really don't know what to do at this point. Maybe it would, uh, it would be uh, uh, best of all for us to start doing the Q&A. You want me to keep on speaking? You're saying <laughs> do this? Well, that's easy enough. I mean, that's what I would like to say, and perhaps this, it's worth, worth your interest. Uh, I've, I have been asked many times what is going to happen uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and is there going to be a Soviet Union? And is there any threat from the Soviet Union? And I think there is one threat now from the Soviet Union. And I see Mr. Donahue right now. Phil, would you please come on in? No, no, no. Please. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're not off the hook yet. Um, Mr. Donnie, we've been saying some pretty nasty things about you in your absence. 
And so we figured we'd uh, like to give you a chance to uh, rebut them. Uh, this, this issue about uh, wearing dresses and the thing, there was some rumor that perhaps the dry cleaner was late. Uh, but actually, we've been listening to Mr. Uh, Posner, and we'd like to hear from you now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, can I have my cup first, and then let's get this over with? Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I did fi just finished two hours with Oliver North, so I hope that will explain my uh, being late. Uh, Koppel did two, I insisted on two, although I had no fireplace, and I am pleased to call your attention to part two, which will air here tomorrow, having uh, been live in uh, Washington, D.C. this morning. I assure you I have no intention of taking up uh, uh, time from uh, what I think is more properly devoted to questions for uh, Mr. Posner, and uh, I'm, I'm flattered if anybody would uh, think that I might be uh, able to make a contribution to anything you might want to ask us. I am pleased to remind some of you of uh, things that you already know, and that is that uh, Vladimir's uh, relationship, uh, my professional relationship with Vladimir began in 1985, and since that time, in addition to two space bridges and uh, visits over there and his visits over here and joint speaking and uh, simultaneous translation and uh, a lot of dealing with the bureaucracy here and there, we are very, very pleased to have the opportunity of being partners in a program which I hope uh, all of you will find worthy of your attention as we make our way in the very competitive arena of uh, weekend talk shows that include one that will celebrate its 44th birthday, I think, uh, very shortly, Meet the Press. And while they do have an almost 50-year uh, lead head start on us, we hope to be worthy perhaps of a program that might serve as a lead-in for these programs or a lead-out. And maybe even someday when they have uh, perhaps a slow news day, we may be able to uh, even compete with these programs. We think we're different. We are pleased uh, to know that we are in the community of uh, news junkies here and hope that you'll find us as, uh, as uh, good as uh, is the excitement that we bring to this uh, undertaking. It is an unusual opportunity to be working with a man who has spent 38 years behind what we used to call the Iron Curtain. And we hope to uh, take full advantage of the unique perspective he brings to the news and the issues about which we all care. And I thank you all very much for your courtesies in, uh, in uh, allowing me to be uh, late. Assure you that it was not a cavalier treatment of this very, very important uh, event. I watch you all the time on C-SPAN, and you all look so much thinner in person. And I, <laughs> and I do thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> What we would like, uh, Mr. Donahue, is if you and uh, Mr. Posner would stand up and take these questions just as a logistical issue. So uh, the first question is uh, reportedly, uh, or why don't you sit there? That might be easier. Yeah, let's sit. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Sit down. Do we actually get a uh, No, yeah. you don't have a microphone. You're going to have to stand up and answer. Um, reportedly, you did not get along so well during your first show. What happened to make the two of you become uh, fast friends? Either one of you. <laughs> uh, I was very, very concerned about our first space bridge. First of all, uh, the Seattle Times laughed at this very silly undertaking. Remember, this was December 1985, the year of Gorbachev's ascendancy. And nobody believed that there would be anything honest at all about an, an exchange of Soviet citizens in Leningrad, then Leningrad, and 200 American citizens in, in Seattle. And uh, we, uh, we, many, many people were convinced this would be, first of all, they would be controlled by the KGB. Uh, they're not going to say what they could be able to say. And the, uh, the deal was that this would go on Soviet television as well as ours. And there were many, many people, some very, very responsible uh, veteran journalists uh, whom I contacted who said, you know, this is not going to happen. They're not going to let in their country anything that's negative about their country. And I was assured they would. And Vladimir assured me they would. And, I really, and so we, we, we took our, they said, they'll, the interpreters will manage the event. So we took our own interpreters. We went into uh, factories on street corners and subway stops and pulled people off the street. Do you want to be on an American space bridge? Niet, said the older people. Most of the younger people, duh. They showed up, 
and to prove to all of these naysayers that this was a legitimate exercise, about 35 minutes in, we just let them have it. What about Sakharov? What about Refusniks? What about uh, hu uh, uh, human rights? Why do you have old men behind closed doors telling you what's good for you? This is not democracy. You are not exploiting the wisdom of the... Rah, 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 rah. And the Soviets sat there like this. They had never seen anything like this. <laughs> and it all aired. It all aired in the Soviet Union, but not until uh, uh, a lot of people almost lost their jobs. That's the American side of this. <laughs> yeah, well, the Soviet side of the answer is that when Mr. Donahue called and said that they had to select the Soviet participants, they were going to choose the Soviets, the initial reaction was, come on, I mean, you know, what is this? Then they explained and they told us that if we can't tell our viewers in the United States that we picked the people in the audience, our viewers are going to say they were all picked by the KGB. So we said, okay. They came over and indeed they selected them and all that. And then during the actual space bridge, uh, Phil came on like Rambo. <laughs> and all of the Soviets, and many of them, had come with flowers. And, you know, they wanted to be friends. They really did. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, instead they're getting socked now, you know. So they were sitting there. And what's, what's going on? They gradually began to get angry. And so this turned into a shouting match. Uh, with, you know, what are you doing, what are you doing, what about your mother and your uncle, and so on, you know. <laughs> Until one very nice looking young man, I think he was a fisherman or something from Seattle, got up and said, don't you all understand that's what they want us to do? Don't you understand they want us to fight? Don't you understand that this is what it's all about, we shouldn't allow them? And that really just turned everything around. It was just amazing what happened after that. And I will say that after this aired in the Soviet Union, it became a, a national event. About 180 million people saw it, which is, you know, for ratings is not bad. <laughs> um, we received 77,000 letters. Uh, that is to say, I received 77,000 letters, in which there were two, two main points. Point number one, Comrade Posner, isn't it wonderful that finally we can talk to each other directly, Soviets and Americans? And number two, Comrade Posner, where did you get the jerks in your audience? <laughs> Why were they so uptight? Why wouldn't they tell the truth? Why were they so evasive? And this was, I think, one of the most important things that happened. The nation looked at itself in the mirror because that audience was the mirror and they did not like their face. And I think that if something started to change in attitudes and in the sense of, of understanding what glossness could mean, I think it began then. And it was uh, a most important beginning. But we were at odds during that particular show. And um, it took a while for us to, uh, to get to know each other. But it's worked out. Uh, to give Mr. Donahue a breather since he has been running around to make it here. Uh, Mr. Posner, uh, were you co-opted by the Soviet intelligence services during your days as a commentator? And actually there is a follow-up. Uh, how about you, Mr. Donahue? <laughs> <laughs> I arrived uh, in the Soviet Union when I was 19 years old and um, about two years later I was uh, called in by what turned out to be KGB representatives. We met in a hotel room. These were people who called to tell me they had a letter from my father for me, who was at that point working in Germany. My mother was with him, of course. So I went to this little hotel, and in this room there were these two people, and they were from the KGB. And after uh, several hours of discussion, uh, during which time they told me about who I was and all the details of my life that I'd forgotten. Um, they asked me would I be a true patriot and work for them. And I said that um, I was a true patriot, but I felt I could be a patriot without working for them. Uh, and we had a rather unpleasant discussion. And from that day on, I was not, well, probably that's when it began, I was not allowed to travel. Uh, I did not 
come back to this country for a period of 38 years. And I was not let out of the Soviet Union until 1977, although we arrived in 1952. And the first time I was let out was to go to uh, Hungary. Uh, so yes, they wanted me and they tried to get me. I will also say that I've been contacted by other intelligence organizations. Uh, I've been much honored by this. Uh, however, I have refused. Uh, and um, I, I've refused for a variety of reasons, among which I just prefer the job of journalist. Thank you. Cultural differences notwithstanding, what single issue should the U.S. and the Soviet Union address with urgency? Either one of you. I don't, th well, the other day when I was asked about the similarity or the difference between Russians and Americans, and I got a question, what single thing? And, and I said, you know, a Russian reaction to that would be, that's a very American question. Because you want the simple answer. What single thing? What one? There isn't one single thing. There's a, there are a lot of urgent problems that the Soviets have to address, and there are a lot of urgent problems that Americans have to address. But what I think is very important, if I were to answer it from a journalistic viewpoint, is to drive home the message that the so-called local problems are really not local. I mean, we keep saying um, that you know, the world is our country. If you look through literature over the, the ages, you find that message time and time again. But we still really don't believe that. We still say, you know, <clears throat> I'm Russian, I'm American, I'm a citizen of this country, of that country. We talk about these, these frontiers and boundaries that, that, that you can't see when you're up in space or in a plane. They don't, don't exist. But they're very much inside of us and in our brains and in the way we, we react to other people. You know, when I say we're going to have Yasser Arafat on the show, someone might, might say, well, take him to ta tell him to take that rag off his head. It's a very... Uh, shall we say, uh, condescending. I mean, he could probably say something about uh, what someone else wears. We have this way of looking at people who are not like us. To me, one of the most important things to do in the world today is to break down that barrier. It may lead to solving most of the problems that we think have nothing to do with it. Mr. Posner, in the USSR, the Islamic republics have been growing more militant and talking with each other and Islamic countries in the Middle East. Do you foresee a rise in Islamic fundamentalism? The, um, the republics of Soviet Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenia, and Kyrgyzia, and to a certain extent, another republic which is also Muslim, but is not in Central Asia, and that's Azerbaijan. Um, in my opinion today, represent a very serious problem, both for the Soviet Union, and I use that term in, in lack of a better one, and perhaps not only for the Soviet Union. They were, their leadership, when the coup happened, their leadership, with the exception of one republic, Kyrgyzia, quickly endorsed the coup, very quickly. When the coup failed, their leadership re uh, acted quickly to preserve the old structure, saying that, for instance, the Communist Party of Tajikistan would no longer be part of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which had been disbanded by Yeltsin, pretty much. So they preserved their entire party structure. They have preserved everything. They remain the old structure within the new body. So it's not just Islamic fundamentalism that certainly has some kind of base in some of these uh, countries. It is Islamic fundamentalism multiplied by the old Communist Party structure. It's a dangerous combination. These are the republics that have joined with Russia and a few others in an economic agreement. But I am very, very doubtful 
about the future of that relationship because of where they stand politically, not just in the sense of any kind of nationalism based on the fundamentalist view. I would keep a very, very careful watch on what goes on in those republics. And I think that they have been disregarded in the news. They have not been sufficiently covered, and they bear covering. Uh, Mr. Donahue, one of our audience would like to know, on your show you have been critical, if not hostile, toward Christianity. In Russia and elsewhere, the people have wide interest in Christianity, and there is a religious revival. And the national morality is a major issue. How will you deal with this issue in this show? Well, if you criticized Jimmy Carter, you were a civil servant. If you criticized Christianity, you're hostile. I, if you criticize public affairs, you're, uh, is okay, you're, you have an uh, interest in uh, civic, offense, if, uh, civic events. If you criticize religion, you have a hang-up. I am not hostile to religion. I have been outspoken in what I think are a lot of uh, not very divinely inspired decisions by the finite, imperfect men who preside over our organized religion, and I will continue to do so. I think the church, all of the churches, all organized religion could use more criticism and not less. Our problem is that if you would presume to do that out loud, you are subjected to all kinds of ad hominem arguments that I think do diminish anybody's enthusiasm for saying anything negative about the church. I assure you, uh, I, uh, some of my best friends are Catholic. <laughs> um, I enjoyed uh, eight, 16 years of Catholic education provided to me at very low, if any pay at all, by a lot of dedicated, uh, passionate, uh, caring individuals, and I'm grateful for that. It does not mean that I believe that today the church's uh, attitude toward homosexuals is in any way Christian. In, in fact, uh, I think in many ways the church, for ex in this issue alone, legitimizes homophobia. I think the church's treatment of uh, divorced and remarried Catholics is wrong. And I think the church's uh, stance regarding sexuality and the prohibition of condoms is irresponsible. If that's hostile, then I am guilty. At a time when people in the USSR are calling for greater democratic ownership of media, do you find it ironic that ownership of media in the U.S. is increasingly concentrated into fewer corporate hands? Uh, Mr. Donahue? Well, I'm flattered that you would care what I think about this. Um, well, let me preach to the choir here. Uh, when I was 22 years old, I covered my first murder, and I stood above the body with a very large tape recorder with uh, vacuum tubes in it, and I said uh, to the chief, you got any suspects? <laughs> and he said, who are you? <laughs> and I said, I'm the press. And I was. I took no board exams. I offered no urine specimen to anybody. I had to pass no tests or appear before any community of people. That's the whole point. Anybody can be the press. We always want it to be that way. If anybody can be the press, then you have a whole lot more people gathering information so that as we all know here at the National Press Club, somewhere in the middle of this large crowd will be likely found the truth. Our problem today is that in the collective middle of the press we find fewer companies increasingly larger in, spoke, uh, in uh, scope, some of them multinational. Many of them worried more about paying off their debt than sticking their toes under a tent. Many of them worrying about being popular rather than probing. And in the middle of this, we've got a, some high priests running around this town saying, I'm the news and you're not. Uh, I think all of us should be very, very distracted that more than 90% of the, of the cities in this country have only one newspaper. I think we should be embarrassed that Newsweek scooped Time and the merger of Time and Warner. If we don't, you know, what more evidence do we need <laughs> that this is not in our best interest to have, uh, to have suddenly, you know, I mean, should, 
I just long for the good old days. I'm not going to sit here like, stand here like Chicken Little and say I have all the answers to this. But yes, I am, I am uh, distracted by the increasing, uh, by, uh, by the fact that we are uh, not only becoming uh, less, uh, more and more concentrated, but we're also becoming more and more, all of us, looking like People magazine. And I know you join me in hoping that'll change quickly. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Posner, uh, please finish your thought as to the threats still existing uh, from, or from Russia and in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> the threat I was, I was uh, alluding to has to do with what might happen in Russia uh, over the next uh, six to eight months. Uh, let me remind you that on June 12th of this year, there were presidential elections in Russia. Uh, when, when Yeltsin was elected president on the first ballot. However, a certain man by the name of Vladimir Zhirinovsky came in third with 7% of the popular vote, 6 million votes. This is a man who no one had ever heard of, basically. This is a man who is a Russian fascist and who heads the equivalent of a Russian fascist party. Now, uh, he made a strong showing then. And my fear is that if things continue to deteriorate in Russia, if life continues to become more difficult, if there is even less in the stores, in the sense of both food and clothing, if the lines are even longer, if the money is worth even less than it's worth, if things really start to fall apart, then I believe there is a danger. And if the rest of the, and if the people, feel that the rest of the world really doesn't care, then I think there is a danger that, that at the next elections, a man like Zhirinovsky, or Zhirinovsky himself, could be elected president, quite democratically, like Hitler was elected president back in 1933 in Germany. And should that happen, that will be a threat to both Russia and the rest of the world. And I think that that danger exists. I don't think it's a probability but it certainly is a possibility, and that's what I had in mind. Uh, another question for you, Mr. Posner. Um, General Akramoyev spoke at the National Press Club in 1989, the first Soviet official to do so since Nikita Khrushchev in 1959. The general committed suicide after the coup attempt. Can you give us any uh, further information on the circumstances surrounding his death? Uh, well, Mr. Akhramayev was not a general, he was a marshal, which is the, the highest uh, of all ranks in the Soviet army. And he was very much um, an establishment person, uh, quite bright, very, quite bright, especially for a marshal, we feel. <laughs> um, we don't, in that sense, in the Soviet Union, we don't have much regard for, um, for top military people in the sense of um, any kind of sophistication. And yet this was a sophisticated man and very, very supportive of the system and someone who did profoundly believe in it. Um, he supported the coup, which is not surprising when you look at his views. Um, but I think his suicide was the result of depression, if you will, of seeing all of his ideals, everything he believed in, just completely disappear. And the final realization that he had lived his life to a very large extent for nothing. There's been a lot of tragedy going on in that country. You see, for many years, the way the media treated the Soviet Union, I'm speaking about the Western media, was that this was a repressive government hated by the people. And it would have been so simple if that were true. But in reality, <coughs> excuse me, the majority of the people supported their government, their form of government. The majority of people loved Stalin. The majority of the people felt that their system was the best in the world. They really believed it. And so when, when this began to unravel, the pain of a proud people, seeing that what they believed in was not true, suddenly beginning to understand that in many ways their country was a third world country, beginning to understand that they'd been lied to and that they'd bought into that lie. It's a very, very difficult thing. I mean, even, you know, Americans who've been very lucky in their short history, when, when they had to deal with defeat in Vietnam, 
or when they had to deal with Watergate, it was really hurt pride that was the worst thing. The idea that, you know, my president would publicly lie or that we were fighting a war that was not just when we're the good guys, it hurts. But imagine what a proud Soviet citizen had to go through and is going through today. And not a few people have committed suicide. You know about Akhramiev, but there are others who are not famous people. So I think that's really the reason. And I think that, uh, again, that type of destroyed pride is a fertile ground for people like Zhirinovsky to appeal to. In a way, and I'm not making any kind of parallel here, but when I think of the way that Ronald Reagan said, we were right to go into Vietnam, not wrong. We did the good thing. They wouldn't let us win, but we did the good thing. And Watergate is really, if you will, a triumph of American democracy because it shows what we can do and even make a president step down. I think people like that because it brought back the pride. And if you have someone who knows how to play to that particular feeling, that can be dangerous. Uh, Mr. Posner, can you characterize the leadership of the Ukraine, and what does the claim of ownership of part of the military, including nuclear weapons, mean to the world? Well, there are two kinds of weapons, obviously, that uh, when we talk about nuclear, there's the strategic weapons and there's the tactical weapons. The tactical weapons are going to be destroyed on both sides, and that's nothing to worry about. But what you have, though, are the, the strategic weapons, the, uh, the intercontinental ballistic missiles. The Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belorussia, and Russia are the four republics that have these weapons on their territories. And both Kazakhstan and the Ukraine, which began by saying we'd like to be nuclear-free zones, are now saying that they will not give up, they will not relinquish their nuclear weapons. Um, what they're doing is using the nuclear weapons as a bargaining chip. I really am not worried about that at all. I do not think that there's any possibility of their suddenly appearing on the face of the globe three more, in addition to Russia, three more uh, nuclear powers. This is not going to happen. If I, even, I would even be ready to say that uh, should push come to shove, uh, the army will be used to make sure that no one gets to those weapons. This is not a time for playing uh, democracy. This is much too dangerous. They have to be controlled by one force. Most likely, as long as there is some kind of loose confederation or whatever, uh, the army will be controlled by the central power, in this case, uh, Mr. Gorbachev and the Soviet Parliament. Uh, if even that falls apart, then the nuclear weapons will be controlled by Russia proper. For, uh, the, 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 the Ukrainians today are playing a certain game because with the forthcoming presidential elections, uh, Mr. Kravchuk wants to make sure that he gets the vote. And so he's playing to the nationalistic sentiment that is very much part of the Ukrainian view today, not only the Ukrainian, by the way, but he's playing to that, uh, and that's one of the reasons why the Ukraine has not signed the economic agreement. He's showing how independent he is so as to win the election. I think once he's elected, as he will be, then we'll see some very rapid change there. What well, politics are politics? Whether you, you're, you're Ukrainian or something else, it really doesn't matter. Tomorrow, the National Press Club will have a forum on the state of the media in the USSR and Eastern Europe. Uh, how do you see the media changing there, Mr. Posner? Well, the media in the Soviet Union, I always wonder, should I say are or is? I mean, when you're in Great Britain, you say the media are, and when you're here, you say the media is. Uh, the media are, good. The media are changing enormously in the Soviet Union. I would say that today, probably, there is no country in the world where a journalist in, in, enjoys greater freedom, believe it or not, than in Russia 
and in some of the other republics. There is n virtually nothing that is taboo. Uh, I think that has to do with the state of flux the country is in. I think it has to do with the lack of yet any real institutions functioning and the absence of any real laws that would regulate things. So to be a journalist today in Russia, I think, is one of the most wonderful uh, experiences. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in newspapers and magazines, the editors are elected by the people who work there. They are not appointed. They are elected. We elect our own editors, which I think is a kind of an interesting twist. <laughs> uh, some, obviously, some, in some places, an editor will be elected because he's a nice or she's a nice person, which may not be good for the publication. That's a process you learn, that you don't necessarily elect someone who's nice, you elect someone who's good at the, at the job. Uh, there are now, there's now a combination of privately owned media, publicly owned media, and government run media, which is fine. There's a combination of that. Uh, it is a whole new ball game. And I think you would be, if you could follow the Soviet press, I think you'd be very excited by what you read. It's much more varied, basically, than what you get in most countries. The one area where it's still somewhat, in my opinion, limited is television, because you only have two national broadcasting networks, one being the former, uh, what was called before Goss Teleradio, and the other being the Russian television network. And I think that the choices are still somewhat limited. But, and the problem there, of course, is technology. You cannot create a new television station if you don't have the, the technology, and the technology is not available. But I think that it's coming. There are already 3,000 cable entities. They're very small. They're only covering parts of cities. But 3,000 is 3,000. So this is developing. And I think that you will see the electronic media being also just as diverse. So as I said, it's really a, it's a very kind of interesting situation that you see there now. Uh, Mr. Donahue, before you get too relaxed, uh, how long has uh, multimedia come committed to your show? As long as there flows black ink. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Posner, um, is, there, uh, is there a Russian version of Oprah Winfrey? <laughs> well, I have to tell you something. Um, as I said, the media are changing in the Soviet Union. One of the things you could see on Leningrad television on Sunday morning, this is before Leningrad became St. Petersburg again, was, believe it or not, Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> Talk about getting religion. I mean, of course, the Russians didn't know who Jimmy Swaggart was. And these shows were very well produced, let me tell you, and very well translated. Here in the United States, they have the money to do that. Um, we have a commercial channel in Moscow called 2 Plus 2, which featured, and may still be featuring, Geraldo, in, translated into Russian. And Russian television this summer featured 15 Donahue shows. And they got such a great response that they are now being repeated at prime time uh, as of October of this year. So if you're asking me, do we have talk shows, uh, the answer is yes. And as a matter of fact, I did a talk show in the Soviet Union before coming here to do this one. Um, and I think that probably Geraldo is uh, uh, is certainly competition for Oprah in certain respects. So, but we don't have our own yet. We haven't yet developed them. But perhaps with your help, we will do that. <laughs> Before I ask our uh, last question, uh, well, Mr. Donahue's already taken I our, I got yours, your mug. Well, we have something else for you too, Mr. Donahue. Uh, we have our well-known certificate of appreciation. Thank you. 
And Mr. Posner, just so you don't feel left out, we do have a mug uh, for you as well, our famous National Press Club Thank mug. Thank you very much. And a certificate of appreciation. Thank you. Actually, it's a two-part question. Um, should we be surprised, Mr. Posner, that you have no accent? And two, Mr. Donahue, uh, how are you dealing with the fact that you may have an accent? <laughs> Well, the only reason why I don't have an accent <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know that all of us KGB trained people don't have accents, come on. Uh, no, you should not be surprised. I spent the first, uh, basically the first 15 years of my life, uh, except for the first three months and then a year and a half between the ages of five and six and a half, I spent all that time in uh, New York City in Greenwich Village, so I speak a certain type of English. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the British have a problem with it, but uh, it is, that's why I don't have an accent. I could add that uh, I, have, I have no accent in French due to the fact that uh, that's where I was born in France. My mother was French and always spoke at home in French, and then of course Russian. So uh, I am trilingual, but it's because of what happened to me rather than any great uh, effort on my part to learn a language well. Vladimir Posner speaks six languages. It is true he is trilingual, meaning he speaks French, English, and Russian in a way that no resident of either country would know he was a foreigner. He also graduated at the top of his class from Moscow University, having done his thesis on a primordial fish uh, evaluating the lung uh, 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 the lung development of the fish so that he could place it on the evolutionary scale and then spend several years quite literally translating Elizabethan poetry from English into Russian. It is my honor in my 55th year of life to be finally working with the son my mother wanted to have. I thank you all very much. <laughs> Here is a programming reminder to join us on Friday afternoon for our weekly political series, Road to the White House. We will bring you remarks by several Democratic presidential candidates, including